Hi, my name is TJ Smith, and I'm going to be presenting a study of all of the chapters of the book of Revelation, uh, known by some as the book of Revelation. What? This is actually the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, as he gave it to John. So in order to understand this book, where I'm going to present uh, a, a series, an episode per chapter. So we will end up with at least 22 episodes, uh, plus this introduction, which is really on dating the book of the Revelation, and maybe another one in between, maybe on the names of uh, Yahweh and Yeshua, that's God and Jesus, for those not uh, acquainted with that. Um, to get going with this, we really need to establish several things. And, and the way to do that is w several ways. We have to understand the language that the first century church spoke. We need to understand the context of what they were saying. We need to understand the audience relevance, which is what did the audience understand about what John was writing to them, uh, the seven churches. <clears throat> we also have to understand the expectations of the first church and their expectations of what the time of the end would look like. We need to understand apocalyptic language, customs, cultures, idioms, figures of speech. It's not, it's not easy. And those that don't really want to study, eh, they don't really want to know. And that's fine. Not everyone seeks to be scholarly with uh, their studies. But I'm assuming you do or you wouldn't be watching. So the one thing that we need to try to do is figure out when the book of Revelation was written. You see, there's, there's two camps to this belief. One camp says that uh, John received this revelation before 70 AD. The other camp believes John received it after 70 AD. You may be thinking, well, big deal. What difference does it make? Well, you'll find out as we get into it, if it was written after 70 AD, then everything in the book of Revelation needs to be fulfilled in the future. If it was written before 70 AD, um, everything's been fulfilled. So that's going to be the starting point of your journey of deciding, <clears throat> studying when this book was written. Now, I have 22 points to share with you in this, in this uh, video, and I'll probably end up with more later, but right now, these are 22 proofs of evidence that points to the authorship of the book of Revelation happening before 70 AD. And really there's only one proof that it was written after 70 AD. So I've got 22 before, and really there's about one uh, pointing to, uh, and after 70, closer to 96 AD, um, authorship. So I'm going to go through those. That's what this lesson's all about. So my name is TJ Smith and I live in Texas and been studying eschatology since the late 1970s. And my personal view is a fulfilled prophetic view, meaning the things that Jesus said he was going to do at the time frame he said he would do them. Well, he actually did them. So that's where this comes from. So excuse me while I get a drink of water. Oh, wow, that water's good. That's some good water right there. Oh, man. Don't you wish you had a nice glass of water right now? So let me get started. I'm going to read. I've got a, another teleprompter here I'm going to read off of. So let me just start into this. Are you ready? Okay. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. We're going to learn a lot. And, and uh, you're going to be real smart when we're done. So, okay, almost all the historical accounts for a late date authorship comes uh, from the early church fathers quoting a man named Irenaeus. 
who lived from about 130 A.D. to around 200 A.D. And there's one particular quote where Irenaeus mentions that the vision was seen almost in his generation, almost in his time. From this mention of Irenaeus, uh, the, what they call a futurist. A futurist is, is a, a believer that thinks all of the things in, in oh, the revelation are going to happen in the future, our future. From this, futurists claim that uh, that's why um, they're going to happen in our future, because Irenaeus said he, John, had seen his vision almost in Irenaeus's generation. Remember, Irenaeus was born in 130 AD. Well, if John saw the revelation close to Irenaeus's generation, well, that probably put John seeing the, the vision after 70 AD. So the futurist really needs Irenaeus to have a clear remembrance and the interpretation of this uh, depends on if Irenaeus wrote, we've seen John almost in our generation, or John saw the vision. And there's a lot of discrepancy among biblical scholars and uh, uh, biblical criticists of, of Scripture that say, no, what Irenaeus wrote was, uh, we've seen John almost in our day. So... First, we start off with the only quote they have being in constant debate uh, as far back as uh, four or five hundred A.D. It was a it's a Latin problem, uh, copies of copies of what he said. Anyway, I need another drink. So you can tell I'm in my study. These are all my books. You see, these are all my books. And I've read each, oh, this one up here, that's one of my favorite ones right there, yeah. Oh, but this one over here, that one, those four right there took me, wow, 30 minutes to read. Anyway, yeah, this is not a green screen behind me, okay? This is a real awesome library that I've accumulated. Yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> Trying to break it up a little bit. So there's a lot of uh, problems, many problems that arise from John having seen the vision after 70 AD. So as I mentioned, first of all, serious scholars admit that the translation from Greek to Latin left little to be desired. The Greek Latin translation of the word it has also been translated he. So it, it's so mixed up, it's, it's hard to know at this point. Uh, one of the um, Irenaeus's quote mentions that John was uh, put on the Isle of Patmos during the reign of Domitian. Now, there is uh, another translation issue with the way the copyist wrote it. It could very well have been Domitius. And that would be one of the names of Nero because his name, he had several names, actually. Um, his name was Domitius Nero Claudius. And he also took a couple of other names. So, but the other issue is, here we go, when Vespasian became emperor after Nero committed suicide in 67 AD, um, <clears throat> Titus, Vespasian and Titus, father and son, had to get back to Jerusalem and settle that war that was going on. They left Vespasian's youngest son, Domitian, in charge. So legally, Domitian was the emperor for about two to three years while his dad, Vespasian, was fighting the Jews across the Mediterranean. So it could have been during this time that the young Domitian uh, was emperor. 
that he banished John to the Isle of Patmos. And it is the same Domitian that returned to power once his older brother Vespasian and Titus, I'm sorry, his, his brother Titus was finished uh, being emperor. So a lot of controversy there about who he was talking about. So most contemporaries of Irenaeus supported aspects of his abilities, but were cautious of his time statements, his actual details. Irenaeus knew Polycarp, uh, who followed John when, while John was still alive. But Irenaeus was just a little boy at the time, and he didn't start writing anything down until he was over 50 years old. And a lot of historians feel that uh, Irenaeus might have confused some of the dates or some of the people or some of the events that had occurred previously. Irenaeus also believed, as did Papias, uh, and Papias was uh, at the same time as uh, Clement and um, Polycarp. So Irenaeus looked up to Papias as well for, for mentorship and leadership. Well, both men believed that, uh, well, take it with a grain of salt. They wrote that Judas did not die after being hung on uh, the night of Jesus' betrayal. That he, he did hang himself, but he lived and then walked through the city for several years, bloated like, you know, like the Michelin man and sores all over his body and, and real puffy and uh, pus would come out of his wounds and worms would escape through his skin. Uh, I don't recall reading that in the Bible. But that's what these two men believed. Now, Irenaeus also wrote that the kingdom of God was the ability to eat all the food that he had been denied while on earth. And this is contrary, directly contrary to what Jesus said the kingdom was. Remember, he said it's not food and drink. So there's two examples where I'm not so sure I'm going to take Irenaeus' opinion on that. Okay. Here is a statement from a historian named Photius. <clears throat> Here's what he said. Indeed, Stephen Gobarus follows neither Papias nor Irenaeus, the holy bishop of Lyons, when they say that the kingdom of heaven is the enjoyment of certain material foods. Now, there's your proof that that's what they believed. And yet, here's another quote from Photius. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons, and Papias, Bishop of Hierapolis, men of apostolic character. But we do not follow them whenever they treated the truth too lightly or were led to speak things against the generally acceptable ecclesiastical teachings. We do not at all take anything away from their patristic honor and glory, though. So that was a letter that uh, Photius writ, wrote to the Archbishop and Metropolitan Aquilius. Now, you notice that Photius used the expression, the generally accepted ecclesiastical teaching. Now, this meant, considering that other doctrinal issues with which historians and other leaders were disagreeing with Irenaeus, you see that the norm was the figurative. Let me get to me and explain what I'm saying. Irenaeus believed certain things about the millennium and the resurrection. What he believed he wrote down. Most of his contemporaries disagreed with him and said, this guy's out of the generally accepted ecclesiastical teaching of what's being taught. So we're going to get into what it was he thought about the uh, millennium. Now, Irenaeus 
wrote that Papias, the gentleman that he looked up to, he was a first-hand hearer of John. And he wrote, quote, to these things, Papias, who had listened to John, and then he continued with his quote. That's all I wanted to tell you. But Papias wrote his own account that he had never met any of the apostles nor studied under them, but rather asked of the presbyters of his own generation what those men had learned from the holy apostles. So Irenaeus was saying, my mentor, Papias, he talked to these guys directly. And Papias said, whoa, 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 no, 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 I, I didn't really ever talk to any of the apostles. I did question men who had been with them, though. So there's, there's three things we've got here that are questionable that Irenaeus is claiming or talking about, okay? Now, the typical figurative rabbinical millennium, this 1,000 years, uh, has been written by Rabbi Akiva, as being as short as 40 years, okay? This notion of a thousand years has been adapted but from the Greek thought process. Uh, it wasn't quite used that way. That wasn't the thought 1,000 exact years. It could be any time that God needed to make something happen, and I'm going to be laying that out more in, as we speak. Now, The same Papias that we're talking about, he's the same guy that historian Eusebius wrote this about in Eusebius's book, The History of the Church, chapter 39.15. Here's what he says about Papias. The same writer gives also other accounts, which he says came to him through unwritten tradition. Certain strange parables and teachings of the Savior and some other more mythical things. To these belong his statement that there will be a period of some thousand years after the resurrection of the dead that the kingdom of God will be set up in material form on this very earth. I suppose he got these ideas through a misunderstanding of the apostolic accounts, not perceiving that the things said by them were spoken mystically in figures of speech. For, you know, Papias appears to have been a very limited understanding, as one can see from his discourses. But it was due to him that so many of the church's fathers after him adopted a like opinion, urging in their own support the antiquity of that man, as, for instance, Irenaeus. So here's Eusebius, a historian of the church, saying, Irenaeus and Papias both believed this strange parable and teaching of the Savior. It's weird that this 1,000 years after the resurrection of the dead, Christ would set up a material, physical kingdom on the earth. His explanation was, I suppose he got these through a misunderstanding of the apostolic accounts, not perceiving that these things were spoken in figures of speech. So Irenaeus and Papias believed in something physical. Eusebius's opinion is that the apostles were looking towards an invisible kingdom and that the 1,000 years wasn't literal. Okay? Time for some water. Okay. Another historian, his name was Philip of Side. He agreed, and he wrote, quote, Papias 
is also in error regarding the millennium, and so is Irenaeus who follows him. Wow, so here's another historian saying that this millennium, this 1,000-year earthly kingdom is going to be spiritual, invisible, and it's a, it's a figure of speech on the 1,000 years. Remember, they had said that these men aren't using the generally accepted ecclesiastical teachings. They're doing their own thing. They're preaching something different than what was being taught back then. Now, another historian, <laughs> Varden Vardape, in his book, Explanations of Holy Scripture, wrote this against Papias. The story of the adulterous woman, which the other Christians have written in their gospel, was written by a certain Papias, a disciple of John, who was declared and condemned as a heretic. Eusebius said this, unquote. Wow. Well, who knew that Papias had been condemned as a heretic? And this is the man that Irenaeus learned from. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't make this up, and I didn't say it. But here's more reasons to question their opinions and their writings. So again, we see that even their contemporaries, not even a hundred years removed from the destruction of Jerusalem, were already having disagreements about doctrinal issues and the nature of the resurrection and the nature and the length of the millennium. The historians saying Irenaeus and Papias are wrong. You figure it out. You do your own research. Don't believe me. I'm, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what history has said. Because you see, in, in, in the 21st century, a lot of futurists have forgot the history. And now they're claiming that what they believe has always been taught in the church. No one's ever believed that those prophecies were fulfilled before 70 AD. No, no one's ever believed that John got that vision before 70 AD. Yet I've just given you four historians who are claiming that Irenaeus and Papias were wrong and called heretics. So, since Papias and Irenaeus believed in a literal 1,000 years and a literal physical bodily resurrection and physical kingdom, and other historians were calling them wrong and worse, heretics, then the other historians must have believed in a figurative rabbinical thousand years and a spiritual resurrection. So, as I mentioned earlier, Rabbi Akiva wrote that the millennium would be 40 years. So, we, this is why I said we have to be able to think like Jews and Hebrews. We can't think Western mind 2,000 years and four languages removed from that. Okay, here's another thing about Irenaeus, and all I'm trying to do is, is set up the table here to show that Irenaeus was not the most reliable guy in the world to be getting information from. Okay, so when a futurist says, well, Irenaeus said, uh, John saw the vision. No, consider the source. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Irenaeus also believed that the book called The Shepherd of Hermas should have been canonized. Um, he was wrong on that. Lastly, he believed that Jesus was uh, Jesus the Savior was 50 years old when he died and stayed with the disciples until the reign of Trajan. Drink of water for dramatic effect. Okay. Now, we, we need to keep these points in mind when attributing too much credit and credence to whether Irenaeus wrote, we saw John almost in our time, or John saw his vision 
almost in our time. Because first of all, there's, there's problems with the language, the translation, the, the copyist. Then you've got all of these issues with Irenaeus's beliefs in other matters of Christianity. Okay. Did Irenaeus document some valid historical information during his lifetime? Sure he did. Yeah, you bet he did. A lot of valuable information. Was he susceptible to errors and mistakes? Absolutely. We must remember that nowhere do any writings put forth that the words of Irenaeus were inspired by God. He was subject to mistakes and incorrect recollections like any other historians and was criticized by his own contemporaries for being inaccurate. Further external questions about the validity of Irenaeus's writings comes from statements made like this one, quote, as these things are so, and this number of the beast is found in all the approved and ancient copies, unquote, he goes on to make a statement. I want to focus on in all approved and ancient copies. Now, this has been brought up by many historians and textual critics. Um, this is in the identity of the beast. See, the problem here, if John wrote this in 96, 97, 98 AD, it's just possibly 30 to 40 years earlier than when Irenaeus is talking about, only 30, 40 years difference. How could that be classified as ancient? I mean, come on. Irenaeus is not speaking even of the original copy that John wrote down and transcribed. He's talking about approved and ancient copies. Now, approved, what does that mean? Well, at the time, there were so many copies of John's revelation floating around the churches that the church began to approve them. They would take the two and they would make sure that every jot and tittle was correct and iota was done properly. If it wasn't, they tossed it. So they would keep these approved copies. And if somebody needed one, Here's an approved copy. Take this and show it to the church. So these were approved copies. Ancient approved copies. Who in their right mind would consider ancient copy to be 20 years old? Hardly. Now, if these, if the revelation was seen around 65, AD, and now we're talking possibly 160 AD. That's a hundred years. Yeah, that would make more sense that these were approved and ancient copies. So, I mean, how many years do you think the, the original letters John wrote was still active and read from and readable? Probably 20. I mean, I'm sure that, that they faded and they got dried out. They tried to preserve them best they could. So, 20 years for an ancient copy is hardly, it's hardly a stretch to be called ancient. So, historian Eusebius and other early church fathers did not necessarily accept Irenaeus' authority as conclusive. Milton Terry from the 1800s said of Irenaeus' late date comment, it seems to us that no impartial mind can fail to see that no great stress can safely be laid upon this late date from a single testimony of Irenaeus. So Milton, Milton Terry said, whoa, don't put too much weight on this because it ain't going to hold up. Too many other church fathers and historians disagree with Irenaeus on this, and textual criticism detects major flaws in the reasoning for a late date. One of the translators for the New King James Version was said in an interview that all the translators associated with that project, the New King James Version, believed 
all the New Testament was written before 70 AD. That would include Revelation. Dramatic water break. Okay, so let's look at a couple of passages from those early church fathers also to get an idea of when they believed the end of time was. Now, you remember, or may, you may not know this, there is no time in the Bible does it ever call it the end of time. It's called time of the end. Time of the end of what? Well, the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was coming to an end, and the New Covenant was about to begin. That's what that means. So here's Ignatius. He wrote this. Having been entrusted with the service of Jesus Christ, who before the ages was with the Father and appeared at the end of time. He's meaning at the end of the Judaic covenant, the Mosaic covenant. But you notice he said Jesus appeared at the end of time. Futurists are looking for Jesus to appear at the end of time. Ignatius said it already happened. Not the end of the world, not the end of chronology, but the end of the Old Covenant. Okay, Ignatius adds this. How can we possibly live without him, whom even the prophets who were his disciples in the spirit, were expecting as their teacher. Because of this, he for whom they rightly waited raised them from the dead when he came. Unquote. Wait. So Jesus came and raised the disciples from the dead? How could they do that? if they were still waiting for him to come? And how could he only come for the dead disciples unless they were actually dead? And by 68 AD, they were all dead. Now you might say, wait, John was still alive. Yeah. But if you know anything about the debate of the authorship of the book of the Revelation, some say it was John the Lesser, some say it was John the Just, some say it was John the Disciple, some say it was John Eleazar, which was Lazarus. So you've got about four possibilities of which John it was. So with that in mind, this is something Ignatius wrote, that Jesus came back for his disciples to resurrect them when he came. Well, they weren't dead at Pentecost, and they weren't dead at the Transfiguration, and they weren't dead at the Ascension, and they weren't dead in Acts 2, and they weren't dead. Only time they were all dead was right before 70 AD. So is Ignatius wrong? Wow, I don't know. My point is, men can have good information about historical facts, like Arrhenius, Irenaeus, but be poorly equipped in the interpretation of spiritual matters. Let me give you a good example. Billy Graham was a great evangelist. Oh, my goodness gracious. How many people did Billy Graham lead to the kingdom? But he probably would not have made a good theologian or an apologist or a debater. Graham's strength was his ability to present the gospel in a way that drew people to the kingdom. That's a reality that exists today. We don't all have the same giftings and teachings. Some of us are arms, some are eyes, some are legs. So not everything Irenaeus taught or wrote was accurate. And for the Christian looking for a future fulfillment of the book of Revelation, simply because of Irenaeus' statement, is not only irresponsible hermeneutics, but a blatant conscious ignoring of historical context and documentation. So, 
Keep this in mind, all right? And once again, you, oh, TJ sure is ripping on poor old Irenaeus. He can't defend himself. Man, I'm just telling you to look at all the body of work of Irenaeus. A lot of it wasn't real factual. Then the one statement that futurists hold on to is so filled with debate and controversy, you might as well just toss it out. So, solid groundwork of study and understanding of Irenaeus's words and his work must be considered as he is the hinge pin of the late date supporters. Okay, now, late date supporters say, well, you early date supporters, you've only got one thing to hint. No, let me tell you how many I've got to hinge my belief on. You ready? Here we go. I'm going to give you 22 of them. So, water break time. Ah, wow, that's really good. That is some really good water. I got to remember that. Water's good. Okay. Number one, the Peshitta Bible, the Aramaic version, says Revelation was written during the reign of Nero. Traumatic pause. Number two, John wrote that the angel told him that John would have to witness to many kings, nations, and peoples. All right. Supposedly, John, if it's not John the Elder or John the Lesser or J John Eleazar, but actually John the Apostle, if it was John, and he had lived to 100 AD, that would place him at about 93 years of age. If he wrote and saw this vision in 96 AD, he was 90 years old. History records that at that age, John was so weak and sickly that they once brought him to a prayer meeting and had to carry him in, and he was only able to mutter few words. Okay, does this sound like the man who could go witness to many kings, plural, nations, plural, and people? No. Sorry. Also, the context of nations in the Bible always referred to Gentiles. The tribes were Israel, Jew, Jews. Nations were Gentiles. <clears throat> so in this condition, John was also expected to go to the Gentiles and preach as well at 90 years old. And he died at 93. So he had three years to get all that accomplished. On the subject of John speaking to many kings, after 70 AD, there were no Jewish rulers left in Jerusalem for John to witness to. They were gone, kept captivity, or they were killed. And there was only one emperor before John died, Trajan. So where were all these kings and nations and people that this 93-year-old man was supposed to go witness to. Doesn't make any sense unless the angel told him this in the mid-60s. Now you got about 40 years to go share this message. Number four, John was told to measure the temple in the book, in the vision. But there was no temple in 96. So, <clears throat> excuse me, why didn't John just correct the angel and say, wait, 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 you want me to measure, measure the temple? Really? I mean, there's, it was destroyed 20-something years ago. How am I supposed to measure the temple? And the angel says, well, you know, it's just figurative. Just act like you're pulling a ruler out of your back pocket. You know, just act like you're going to start stepping it off so I can stop you. you no. John never mentioned that the temple was destroyed. Interesting that the angel would ask him to do something that was impossible for him to do. Dramatic pause. Okay, number five. In, in chapter 17, verse 10, 
It says five kings were, one was going to come, and one was. That's seven, right? Okay, let's see what we got. Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius. Nero was, and Galba was to come for a little while, like six months, and they killed him. So there's your fulfillment of 1710. Chapter 2, verse 9, and chapter 3, verse 9. The people where they meet is called the synagogue. The temple actually is called the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> Again, 96, there were no synagogues in Jerusalem. 60s. A.D., there were about 200 synagogues and one really nice temple. But in 96, rubble. I'm going to just pause for just a second. Uh, did you miss me? I had to plug my computer in. I forgot for the power. Okay. Number seven, references all over the book, the vision, like soon and shortly, at hand, quickly. They all dem demand strong consideration for first century fulfillment. Number eight, John wrote to seven churches. Had he written in 96, there would have been way more than seven. And if he meant 2,000 years later, those original seven churches don't even exist anymore. Number nine, John wrote in chapter one, verse nine, that he was a companion with them in the tribulation. There was no tribulation in those churches in 96 AD. The Jewish persecution was over. And the real Roman persecution hadn't started for Bobby another 30 or 40 years. But nevertheless, they were suffering tribulation then in the mid-60s. Number 10, John never mentions Titus <clears throat> or the destruction of Jerusalem. It would have been inconceivable to write about this in 96 and not mention the destruction of your own beloved city. Anyone who wants to write a, a history of America is, is not going to leave out 9-11. You're not going to just gloss over that like it didn't happen. It doesn't make sense that John got this vision after 70 AD. Number 11, it's inconceivable to have Judaizers infiltrating the church in 96 AD since Jerusalem was destroyed and there hadn't been a sacrifice or a circumcision in 25 years. So how effective would a Jewish supporter been trying to persuade a Christian to return back to Judaism with no feasts, no sacrifices, no festivals, no, no new moon celebrations, no Passover, no Pentecost. No. We're talking 96. Do you realize that even after 70 AD, Rome continued to follow the Jews? Masada in 73. They were still following them around and killing off the Jews who were resisting them. They weren't killing the Christians, but they were killing the Jews. So what kind of Jew is going to run around going, I'm a real Jew? Did I say that out loud? Don't let the Romans hear me. Y'all need to come back with us, and we'll go back to that destroyed town uh, of Jerusalem, you know, 20 years ago when not one stone was left on another. Still hadn't been rebuilt. But let's go back there and stand around, and let's be Jews again. No, come on. It's ridiculous. Okay? Great point right there. Now, Revelation was written to reveal, not obscure or confuse. 
why would John have instructed them to calculate the number of the beast if it were an impossible task? He told them. Well, TJ, you see, he actually, uh, he actually told us to do that. So he wrote to them, but it's really supposed to be writing to us. So we're supposed to be the ones for you. Oh, okay. So John wrote to the seven churches, but was telling them things he knew they'd have no way of knowing how to figure it out. But he did it for some generation, 2,000 years away. Really? That leads me to point 13. John writes in chapter 1, verse 9, grace and peace to you. How could they have grace and peace trying to figure out the number of the beast if it wasn't going to be for 2,000 more years? That was an unnecessary statement to them, if, if not outright confusing and mean. Number 14. Revelation 2.9, Jesus said he knew their works and tribulations. Okay. Uh, there were no tribulations in 96 AD. I just said that. He also tells them that some say they're Jews but are not. Okay. Once again, no Jew was claiming to be a Jew in 96 AD. That was pretty much a death sentence by the Romans. And there was no temple for them to prove their genealogical records. That's how you proved if you were a Jew. They had no records, and they couldn't prove it. Okay. Let's see how we're doing here. Number, number 15. Theoflact wrote this. Quote, when he lived in exile... John the, ba John the Revelator, when he lived in exile in the island of Patmos 32 years after the ascension of Jesus. Do the math. That's 65 AD. Nervous biting of my nails. Oh, no. A real date. Okay, number 16. Chapter 7, there were 12 tribes. Yet after 70 AD, all the records were destroyed, so no tribes could ever be confirmed. Kind of ridiculous for John to talk about 12 tribes 25 years after all the records have been des destroyed and people don't even remember anymore and they can't prove it. Right? Okay. Number 17. Historian Tertullian places the banishment of John to the island immediately after John's deliverance from the boiling cauldron of oil. But when was that? Well, Jerome says that event happened during the reign of Nero. So we, what, we got two guys here in, in corroboration uh, to uh, mess up history? No. They were telling exactly what they thought was happening. Number 18, Epiphanius wrote, John was banished during the reign of Claudius. Nero's name was Claudius Nero Augustus, and in some languages, Claudius Nero Domitius, which would account for the name confusion of John being banished during the reign of Domitian as we spoke about on the intro. Number 19, Vespasian was named emperor at Nero's death. Now, there were two short-lived Philian emperors. Vespasian placed, uh, placed his second son, Domitian, on the throne with all the power of Caesar, while Vespasian and Titus were busy dealing with the rebellion in Jerusalem. This was the same time that John was on the Isle of Patmos during the reign of Domitian, if you want to go there. Consider that this same Domitian, who actually did end up persecuting the church later, once he assumed power, was the same Domitian that probably would have banished John while acting as Caesar 
while daddy was away fighting a war. Because he hated, he hated Christians and Jews more than his dad. His dad didn't really hate the Jews. He really didn't want to be there. Okay. Tertullian had this to write about the extent of Domitian's cruelties. Because a lot of futurists will say, Domitian was way worse than Nero. Oh, it was horrible. Really? Here's what Tertullian wrote about Domitian. A similar attempt at atrocities had once been made by Domitian, who almost equaled Nero in cruelty, but I suppose because he had some common sense, he very soon stopped, even recalling those he had banished. Number 20, John's recognition of Laodicea's economic status in Revelation 3. Okay. Some skeptics claim that since Laodicea experienced an earthquake in 60 AD, that there's no way they could have rebuilt in seven years, proving that John was writing symbolically to some church era in the future. Gee, probably ours, right? Okay, yet historical accounts do refer to this town using its own resources, its, its rich uh, uh, citizens that live there, without any Roman help to rebuild. This could easily have led to that arrogance that John refers to. How look at us, we're rich, we don't need anyone. You know, we rebuilt our city in six years. Okay, I'll be covering the historical uh, setting of this town in chapter 3. Number 21. This is probably the biggest hurdle a futurist will have to have at proving that the events of Revelation are actual time statements used in the book itself. Okay? It's going to be things like this. Revelation 22, 6. These time statements. The Lord of the Holy Prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. 22, 10. He said, seal not up the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. John the Revelator, Daniel's vision. Daniel was told to seal it up because it would be another 400 years until those prophecies came true. And for any generation during that interim period to read those prophecies, they were going to be confused and scared and in despair for no reason. So why would the angel tell John to not seal up his vision if there was 2,000 more years coming. So suddenly, seal up the vision means 400 years, because that's a long time away. But I'm coming quickly. Don't seal it up, because it could, it could be, you know, another 2,000 years or so. No. The only reason the angel would have said that is if it was soon, quickly, before 70 AD. Okay. Revelation twenty two twelve, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation twenty two twenty, Which he testifies these things, saying, Surely I come quickly. Now, the last one I've got, number 22, and we're, we're going to be done for today. The last one. This is, this is the hardest one for futurists to overcome. There's really no way to deal with this. Here's, here's the logic behind it. The literal uh, interpretation Bible, it's called literal interpretation Bible, reads like this. Chapter 22, right at the end. The one acting unjustly let him still act unjustly. And the filthy, let him still be filthy. The righteous now, let him still do righteousness 
and the holy, let him still be holy. Jesus is commanding the churches to stop evangelizing. That's what this verse means. He is saying that the days, he's, he's, he's not even saying the days are coming, nor the day is coming, or not even the hours are coming. Now Jesus is saying the time is now. The hour is ended. It's over. And we see this progression from the beginning of Jesus' ministry when they would say, the days are coming, plural. And then further in the ministries, the day is coming. And then you would see John, first one, two, and three, John saying, the hour is coming. Now we see Jesus saying, it's over, okay? Stop witnessing. No more reason to try to bring people in the kingdom. Judgment is here. Judgment arrived and it was about to begin. It's just like in Noah, when that door started coming up and it started raining, nobody, nope. Nobody reached over the edge, tried to help some people get in. Nobody tried to get them to climb. They didn't drop a rope over the side. They didn't try to help them get in before that door shut on that ark. Uh-uh. It was over. It's time to separate the ghosts and the sheep. So John was not saying this. Jesus was. If Jesus gave this revelation, here's where the common sense, horse sense, logic comes in. If Jesus gave this revelation to John to send to the seven churches being persecuted in the mid-60s, then this makes perfect sense why Jesus would say, the time has arrived. And as I said, we see this progression occurring. However, sadly, I'm going to have to go here and try to, try to make sense of this one. If the vision was shown to John in the 90s, as futurists have to defend, then every Christian in every generation since 70 AD has been disobedient to the words of the Savior. Because in every generation... Every believer has tried to share the gospel, make concerts, bring uh, converts, bring people in front of the Lord. But Jesus clearly commanded us to stop in 96 AD. But you notice, Jesus didn't say, he didn't add this to the end of the verse. He didn't say, now understand that I want you to keep evangelizing until the day you think you could properly interpret these revelations. Then I want you to stop spreading the gospel. It might be two or 3,000 years from now. No. He told them to leave the wicked to their own devices. He said, let the righteous be righteous. Let the holy be holy. Let the sinners keep sinning. Let the unholy be unholy. It's over. It's time of judgments now. He commanded them to no longer spread the message because it would do no good. If it was written after 70 AD, we've been disobedient to Jesus for 2,000 years. We've been out here trying to spread the gospel. What's wrong with us? Why are we doing spreading the gospel when Jesus said, don't do it anymore because the time has come? See, it makes absolutely no sense why Jesus would tell any generation to stop witnessing except the one that was about to face judgment and the time of the end of the old covenant had come. Okay. Uh, the later day authorship of 96 AD depends solely on a quote from Irenaeus, which is filled with internal and external problems, both in ancient times and modern. Many other respected sources believe an early date is cohesive with the revelation and with historical events that have occurred since. So I hope this all kind of makes sense to you. It does to me. Uh, I don't know any other points that the futurist grabs. And even the one that says, well, I don't even consider what Irenaeus says. I can read the Bible. Well, everything of your presupposition was based on what has been taught from Irenaeus' statement, misstatement. 
take all of these considerations, 22 points I just gave, take those into consideration. So if you'd like to get in touch with me and uh, hate on me a little bit, which I'm sure some of you will, you can leave your comments on here. I'm going to leave them alone. Uh, the message speaks for itself. The common sense speaks for itself. And um, if you'd like to uh, contact me, do so on my uh, comment page on here on YouTube. And I'll be glad to uh, correspond with you respectfully, if you'll be respectful. Those who would like to know more about this uh, fulfilled eschatology, let me know. And I'll be glad to share with you and give you resources. And our next episode will be chapter one. So. Hope you enjoyed yourself. God bless.